Hello everyone, welcome back. Today I'll be covering supercondylar fracture humerus in children, a simplified version. Start off with an introduction, pathophysiology, clinical examination, radiological examination, classification of fracture, temporary traction modalities, the management, and lastly complication of supercondylar fracture. As an introduction, supercondylar humerus fracture in children are the most common fracture of the elbow. Commonness is an extension type due to fall onto outstretched hand with the elbow in full extension. High risk of immediate complication potentially limb-threatening due to the involvement of neurovascular structures requires a close observation and proper protocol management. The potential complication include cubital varus deformity, loss of mobility and social implications to the child and family. Pathophysiology The distal humerus anatomy is frequently fractured due to its configuration in two columns connected by thin bone represents a zone of weakness. When a fall on outstretched hand, the olecranon engage on the olecranon fossa and if elbow extension progresses, the olecranon finally acts as a fulcrum on the fossa. The bone begins to break at first anteriorly and the fracture progresses posterior, posteriorly. If the energy is high, the posterior cortex disrupts and finally complete posterior displacement of the distal fragment occurs with the posterior periosteum X as a hinge. This figure illustrates the anatomy of the elbow joint or the lateral view whereby during extension, the olecranon will engage in the olecranon fossa. If the pressure continues, it will cause a break in the supercondylar region. For clinical examination, the commonness is elbow deformity, especially in a very displaced fractures. Examination of the entire upper limb extremity is essential to exclude associated distal radius, most frequent forearm or proximal humerus fractures. Concomitant upper limb fractures will cause severe trauma and instability, but also create increased difficulty in treatment and increased incidence of neurovascular injuries or compartment syndrome. In displaced extension type fracture, the S deformity is usually present. This figure shows the S shaped deformity of the left upper limb Signs such as extensive ecchymosis, soft tissue swelling, and skin puckering indicate severe trauma. Skin puckering signs appear when the proximal fragments transects the brachialis muscle, puckering the deep dermis. When skin puckering is present, severe displacement and soft tissue damage, including the brachial artery, and the median nerve entrapment should be suspected. This figure illustrates the ecomosis at the middle side of the elbow region with the skin puckering that indicate the brachialis muscle puckered into the deep dermis. 
the x-ray for this clinical examination shows a severely displaced supraconylar fracture. Vascular status evaluation is mandatory. Vascular compromise exists up to 10 to 20% of displaced fractures. Important to check the distal pulse and hand perfusion pre and post operatively. Neurological examination might be challenging. The median nerve and anterior interosseous nerve AIN can be assessed with active flexion of the distal interphalangeal joint of the index and thumb. For radial nerve, assess the thumb extension. For ulna nerve assessment, see for first interosseous contraction, finger abduction. For radiological examination, standard anteroposterior AP and through lateral radiograph of the elbow are usually sufficient to characterize the fracture. True lateral view is essential, and the main anatomical landmark to be evaluated in the lateral view is the anterior humeral line AHL. This line continues the anterior cortical of the humerus and in a normal elbow should traverse the capitulum in its middle third. This figure illustrates the anterior humeral line. As you can see, the anterior cortex of the humerus will normally traverse the capitulum in its middle third. In a displaced fracture in extension, the anterior humeral line will pass anteriorly or may not even cross the capitulum. In case of a flexion type fracture, the anterior humeral line passes posteriorly to the capitulum. The lateral view also allows assessing the degree of displacement and the integrity of the posterior cortex. This figure illustrates a lateral view of the elbow region. A. The anterior humeral ligament traverses the middle third of the capitulum. Normal X-ray for B is a type 1 supraconylar fracture where the anterior humeral line crosses anteriorly and type C is a type 2 supraconylar fracture with AHL cross anteriorly to the anterior and posterior fat pad sign can also be evaluated in the lateral radiograph. The diagnosis of non-displaced or minimally displaced fracture can be challenging. The posterior fat pad sign is suggestive of non-displaced fracture of the elbow. However, anterior fat pad sign can be present in a normal flex elbow and therefore is not so specific for fracture diagnosis. This figure illustrates the anterior fat pad sign that might be normal in an elbow lateral view. The asterisk shows the posterior fat pad sign is present. That might indicate a minimally displaced or undisplaced fracture of supraconylar region. Regarding anterior posterior radiograph. Evaluate the direction of displacement, the presence of varus or valgus alignment, and the extent of fracture combination. The moment's angle, which the angle formed in the AP view by the deficit axis of the humerus and the fissure line of the capitulum, 
is used to assess various or vagus alignment of the distal humerus. However, Bowman's angle has a broad range of normal value, around 64 degree to 82 degree, and varies great, greatly with humeral position on the radiograph, that is rotation. This figure illustrate Bowman's angle, label A. The normal value is around 64 degree to 82 degree. It is an angle formed in the AP view by the facial axis of the humerus and the facial line of the capitalum transaction. For B, it shows the ulnar humeral angle. The angle between the ulna and the humerus. Regarding classification of fracture. Widely used is Gartland classification. This is based on the amount of displacement of the distal fragment. Based on Gartland, type 1. Non-displaced fracture less than 2 mm. The anterior humeral line still crosses through the in, through the center of the capitulum. This fracture is stable because of the integrity of the periosteum. This figure illustrates the Gartland type 1 fracture. You can see the anterior humeral line is not significantly displaced, still transected almost normally and there is a less than 2 mm displacement of the fracture. This figure is straight the anterior posterior and lateral view of the Gartland type 1 undisplaced. Again, we can see a anterior humeral line is a bit affected. And the posterior fat pad sign present. Type 2 moderately displaced more than 2 mm. The anterior humeral line passes anteriorly to the center of capitulum. The posterior periosteum is intact but acts as a hinge. In type 3, Completely displaced, this more unstable fracture with extensive soft tissue and periosteal damage and increased incidence of neurovascular injuries. This figure illustrates the Gartland type 2, where you can see the intact posterior cortex or intact posterior periosteum. The displacement is more than 2 mm. This X-ray view shows the Gartland type 2 with coronal plane deformity. In the lateral view, there is an intact posterior periosteum and cortex. This figure illustrates the Gartland type 3 whereby the fracture is completely displaced. Traction that can be used while waiting operative procedures. We can use 1. Straight lateral traction. I will show you the illustration. Number 2. Side arm traction or Dunlop traction. I will show you the figure. The first figure shows the straight lateral traction that is being used for this patient while awaiting for op. You can see the direction of pull is straight with the weight the on the other side. For side arm skeletal traction, you can see the shoulder is in abducted position. C 
60 degree of elbow flexion. The traction that is being used about 1.5 kilo. And there will be a counter traction about 1 kg that is put above the elbow region. Okay, everyone. Okay, regarding management. Type 1, conservative with above elbow plaster of Paris or cast. Type 2, can be conservative or operative. You can refer to my previous video. Type T, always operative either by closed manual reduction and K-wire or open reduction and K-wire. This figure illustrate the post-op cross K-wire check X-ray. Post reduction. Complication. It can be divided into A, complication prior to treatment, or B, early complications after treatment and late complications after treatment. A, complication prior to treatment. 1. Neurological involvement due to traumatic tenting or entrapment, especially the anterior interosseous nerve in the extension type of fracture and ulnar nerve in the flexion type fracture. Number 2. Vascular involvement, especially the breaker artery. Number 3. Compartment syndrome. This figure shows the complication that may arise. Presence of claw fingers of the middle ring and little finger. Complications after treatment. Number one. Early in the days after treatment, loss of fracture reduction, neurological iatrogenic injury during close repositioning or percutaneous spinning, especially in ulnar nerve if pin done medially, in median nerve if the pinning performed laterally. Vascular compromise, compartment syndrome, Infection at the K-wire region. Number two, late complication in treatment include angular deformity, loss of mobility, cubitus varus, cubitus vagus, avascular necrosis of the trochlea, and others. Yeah, we have reached to the end of this video. I hope it helps. See you in the next one. Take care and bye.